Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Nina. I, I wish I could tell you that uh, when we planned this program, we were, we were futurists ourselves, that we were visionaries and that we could foresee the circus that would be Justice Kavanaugh's uh, confirmation process and know that Nina would be just the person to come here and talk. Uh, alas, we weren't futurists. We were just lucky. Um, but I'll take that luck any day um, because we are lucky to have with us uh, some futurists. And by that I mean scholars on where our legal profession is going over the next 50 years. And we're lucky to have with us uh, to moderate that program uh, Martha Mazzoni, Fidelity Investments Council, and uh, fellow trustee. Marty? Oh, we're going to go right into it. Right. We realize we're the only thing standing between you and wine. So we wanted to get right into it. So I'm happy to introduce the future of the profession panel. I'm Maureen O'Rourke, the most recent past dean at Boston University School of Law. And I want to thank Sal and Marty for inviting me here today. There's not a big market for former deans. Um, so I'm pleased to be here. So my goal today is actually to take a look at some data that you may not have seen before, but that provides some of our context, or at least the context that the newest members of the profession and the law schools that train them face. When we talk about the legal profession, we all tend to focus on postgraduate employment and employers, what's new in the practice, what's new at the firms. The law schools tend to come up in the conversation as part of the problem. In short, many in the profession view the schools as too expensive, too long, and too divorced from the practice of the law to be able to train their students to do anything useful immediately after graduation. I will leave it to Dean Perlman to provide an overview of some of the things that are happening in the schools that might lead you to question those assumptions. I just want to note at the outset that we shouldn't forget that the schools are a critical part of the profession. And when the practice of law changes, it presents challenges for the schools in terms of their applicant pools, economic models, and employment results, and challenges for their students in terms of their debt loads, bar passage rates, and of course their employment results as well. So let me just show you some of the data here. You've probably all heard that there was a drop in the market for law students. This graph illustrates it. It, it was as a severe drop, close to a 30% drop in enrollment at ABA approved schools. I will note though that it will tick up this fall by about 8% from where it is now. We call this effect in some circles the Trump bump. Um, Reading applications, it seems that most of the new students want to go into immigration law, which is laudable, but we hope that some of them will switch because there won't be enough jobs on the back end if they all decide to stay in immigration law. Now, in terms of who are these 37,400 students, well, in your materials in the online posting of the slides, you'll see more data than this. I'm just hitting the highlights here. But picking up on something that Ms. Totenberg remarked on, which is the presence of women lawyers in the profession, one of the interesting things to note is that for the first time, there were more female law students in the country than male law students. Interesting for a number of reasons, but I think what will be most informative will be to see what happens to them because we certainly have studies that show us that over time, women lawyers tend to leave the profession in greater numbers, greater percentages than their male counterparts. So will that still be the case, and will this trend continue to hold? In the slides available in the materials, you'll see some other things that are interesting. For example, the percentage of minority lawyers enrolled in law schools tends to track the percentage that are coming out of college with bachelor's degrees. So the, the challenge is not so much in the college to law school pipeline as it is in the high school to college pipeline, it appears, in terms of increasing diversity. We're seeing fewer first generation students. The students that we see are, are somewhat more affluent in terms of their parents' backgrounds. And that may be simply because that's what has occurred in society over time. The college degree has become more prevalent. It may also be a sign that fewer students can afford to attend law school now. Another thing that you'll note is that we have many more non-JD students in our institutions than we used to. 
They've gone up to about 14% of the population in U.S. law schools. And that presents a lot of challenges for institutions like our Supreme Judicial Court, which is in charge of overseeing who is admitted to the bar. Many of these students are LLMs that come from foreign countries. Where are they going to go after graduation if they want to stay here? Can they pass the bar should they be admitted? So those are just some of the questions with respect to the composition of the enrollment at our law schools. In terms of our students and how much they're paying, well, the graph shows you that tuition tends to go up. Historically, it has tended to go up anywhere between 3 and 5% per year, resulting in an exponential increase in tuition over a long period of time. It's gone up at far higher than the rate of inflation. But what the aggregate numbers don't tell you is what the students are actually paying. Any law school class now is like a giant airplane. The person in the seat next to you is not paying the same fare as you're paying. And in particular, as the supply of law students drop, simple supply and demand, the price dropped also, not the sticker that you see, but what the students actually paid. So discount rates, discount off list, have gone from anywhere, in my experience, from 20% to 50%. Um, but you would never know that by just looking at the aggregate numbers. One thing to consider about where that money goes is it tends now to go, depending on where you are in the rankings, to buy LSAT scores. So 20 years ago when I first started in the business, much of our financial aid budget was devoted to need, with merit in some ways a secondary consideration. Now you get a merit scholarship off the top, and then maybe you'll get a need scholarship. So that may have something to do with what I referred to earlier in terms of the affluency of the population that is actually attending schools. Where do they go when they graduate? Well, just in terms of numbers, it looks like things are trending in a good direction, right? And the red is there only because they changed the reporting date. The blue is nine months after graduation. The red is 10 months after. And you'll see the big crash, which is really not news, I think, to anyone, when particularly the big firms really cut back on their hiring in the aftermath of the recession. However, this percentage that looks so good is not actually driven by more jobs. It's driven almost entirely by the drop in the class size. Because if you look at the jobs, they've gone down dramatically. But because the class size also went down dramatically, the percentage employed actually went up. The jobs themselves are still heavily weighted toward private practice. Within that, I realize I'm going uh, fast here, but Martha's only given me five minutes. <laughs> so within that 54%, we see another 54%. The majority of the private practice jobs are in solo to 50-person law firms. I think not a surprise to anyone here, but perhaps a surprise to some of our students. The, this distribution and the prior one has a, an implication in terms of income to our new graduates. This is what we call our bimodal salary distribution. If you look at it, students, new graduates, are in two big clumps. It's not a normal curve, right? It is a bimodal distribution. And on the, the right tail, what you see are the big firm salaries. But notice how steep that peak is. There aren't a lot of students, percentage-wise, that are making that kind of money, as opposed to the left-hand side of the distribution where you have the majority of students and they're making less than $100,000 a year, which has some implications, again, for their ability to repay their debt after graduation. The good news is, right, that there's some reason for optimism here. The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that over the next 10 years, lawyer positions will have the most openings among positions requiring a graduate or professional degree. I think, though, that we need to poke a lot behind those actual numbers to see what they mean by lawyers. Because as Dean Perlman and Brian's presentations will demonstrate, what it means to be a lawyer is changing quite dramatically. With that as a background, you can read the, the concluding thoughts here. Just one detailed comment and one broader picture comment. The detailed comment is that the federal government has been considering legislation to place a cap on the borrowing that graduate students can engage in under the federal direct lending programs. They would set that cap at 
about $28,500 per year and over a person's lifetime, a cap of $150,000 for graduate study. A cap of $28,500 per year in direct student loans presents a problem for every law school in the country, especially when you factor in the cost of living on top of tuition. Even a 50% discount rate is not going to make that feasible uh, for a lot of schools. It will also change, again, the, comp the composition of the candidate pool. Because if you can't get a federal loan, you'll go to a private bank. Who's a private bank going to lend to? Good credit risks. Who are good credit risks? Well, people who have money or who have someone in their life who has money and can co-sign for them. So that may have some implications. It's a detailed point, but it's a very important point if you're in the trenches of law schools. The broader point is the prediction or the, the way that Nina sees the world, right? There's a risk to all of us as lawyers that the current politicization will really tarnish our reputations, tarnish the reputation of the law and of the legal profession. Uh, I attended an ABA meeting where a military lawyer spoke about how at her institution they actually teach their students integrity. I didn't think that was something that you could be taught. I thought you either had it or you didn't. But if it can, then I think that's probably the most important things that law schools could start to do because that's the one thing that we're in crying need of right now. So let me turn things over. Thank you, Maureen. So uh, we're taking a look back in time today, 50 years, and we're going to be looking forward. And I'd like to take you back in time and think about the practice of law 50 years ago, maybe even 100 years ago. Uh, and I think when we imagine what law practice looked like maybe a century ago, it might look a little something like this. A couple of old guys, typically white men, sitting around a table with some papers, with some books on the shelves. Uh, and when we imagine law practice at that time, certain words come to mind, uh, certain ways of delivering legal services. Lawyers were generalists. They pretty much handled anything that came through the door. They were more often than not solo practitioners. There were not many associates, if any. There weren't paralegals. They handled it all from soup to nuts. When we think about law practice today, however, uh, an entirely new vocabulary comes to mind. New knowledge, new skills, a new way of doing things that I think can best be characterized by two words, and those words are rapid change. And we see the manifestations of that rapid change in so many different parts of the industry. Let's start with corporate legal departments, which drive a lot of legal spend in the country. We see the rise of the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium and the legal operations role inside of legal departments. This organization uh, started off maybe five years ago or so with zero members, now has several thousand controlling literally billions of dollars of legal spend. Uh, and they have developed a range of new competencies uh, that they think are important for people in their legal department and notably for their outside counsel. Uh, concepts and competencies like data analytics, project management, process improvement, the use of automation to deliver legal services in new ways. And what we're seeing are corporations using this expertise, particularly data analytics, to expect lawyers to deliver services differently. This announcement caught my eye last year when Microsoft announced that within two years, 90% of its outside legal work would be done not with a billable hour, but with an alternative fee arrangement. 90% of its work. Uh, and when lawyers are expected to deliver those services outside of the billable hour, they're going to have to think in new ways about the ways in which they serve their clients. And we see the rise of competition. It's not just law firms anymore. We see alternative legal services providers that are delivering le uh, legal services uh, to corporations. We see law firms trying to adapt. These are just two notable examples. Davis Wright Tremaine in the Northwest developing its own research and development team inside the law firm to reimagine the way in which they serve their clients. Dentons, the largest law firm in the world by headcount, uh, created something called Next Law Labs. And these are just a couple uh, of examples. Other law firms are partnering with the alternative legal services providers. Uh, and this is a headline uh, ripped from the news uh, from earlier this year with one such partnership. 
Uh, and it's not just the corporate side. For those of you serving the consumer side, we know that there are a range of new competitors to our work who are delivering legal services in new ways to the public, the bottom line, as we need to evolve as a legal profession. The question is, what is the typical lawyer reaction to these developments? Now, before becoming a dean, I was a law professor, so I like multiple choice questions, and I'm going to give you two possible answers to this question. I know it's getting late. Uh, we're about to get to wine, but bear with me. Uh, two answers. Is the answer to this question of the typical lawyer reaction? Uh, this guy, um, and bonus points for anybody who recognizes him, Locutus of Borg, uh, Jean-Luc Picard, when he became one with technology, uh, against his will, but nevertheless became one with technology, or uh, is the answer uh, something that, like that image? A and the reason that we laugh uh, from this image is that we recognize it. We recognize it amongst ourselves and our fellow lawyers in the profession. So another question that I like to ask is why? Why is that second picture the more likely response to these developments? And here's where I'm going to talk a little bit about law schools and take us back in time once again, 100 or so years ago, uh, to what legal education looked like. Uh, now, this man, Christopher Columbus Langdell, came up with a pioneering approach to legal education at a law school across the river. And his concept was, um, let's not simply prepare lawyers by having them as apprentices or reading treatises about what the law is. Rather, let's have law students read primary material, cases, extract from those cases basic legal principles, and then apply those legal principles to a set of facts that the students have never seen before, the case method of legal instruction, which spread to just about every law school in the country. Well, a lot has changed, as my first few slides suggested, and I hope uh, you ex have experienced that yourself. So what does legal education look like today? Well, um, <laughs> partly the answer, and, and as Maureen said, there's a lot going on at law schools. And the reality is we actually have pushed uh, Christopher Columbus Langdell off to the side in many respects. Uh, we have added not only new doctrinal courses, new areas of the law that have emerged, but we are teaching new skills, new competencies that our graduates need to have. We do that through clinical programs and legal writing instruction, but that's not enough anymore. In light of the changes that we're seeing in the legal industry, we need to do a lot more than simply that. So what are the possibilities? It seems to me that law schools need to be at the forefront of helping our students orient towards the future. We are very good about being backwards looking. After all, we teach through precedent. But we need to help, help them understand what's on the horizon. I'm going to give you one example, just because I know it well and I'm the dean there. But there are literally dozens of law schools that are doing something very similar to what I am about to describe. That is, they are embracing these changes. They are recognizing that technology and innovation uh, are changing the legal industry and that the next generation of lawyers needs to be prepared for those changes. So this is just an example from one school, but I can tell you, and I'm, Maureen would tell you the same, that it is happening industry-wide. We've developed a concentration, which is like a, a major in law school, in legal innovation and technology, teaching the kinds of competencies that places like the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium are emphasizing, like process improvement, legal project management, design thinking, understanding the end user, and designing solutions for them, and a wide range of other skills uh, and knowledge. We've also uh, developed new initiatives. For example, we've created a legal innovation and technology lab. The concept here is a new kind of clinic. So the traditional law school clinic represents clients, individual, let's say, facing an immigration matter or a, cr a criminal defense matter or housing eviction and represents that individual. And you get invaluable experience representing that client. What the Legal Innovation and Technology Lab does is imagine a client in a different way. Imagine that your client is a law firm, it's a legal department of a corporation, it is a court, it is a legal aid office, and they are in need of reimagining what they do. And the students in this clinic are taking the classroom knowledge that they've developed and helping a client, these organizational clients, rethink the delivery of their own services so that they can do it better, faster, and cheaper. It's a new way to think 
about clinical education, and we're placing some students inside our traditional clinics and helping our own clinics rethink the way they go about their work so that they can help more people and prepare our students for a rapidly changing world. We've developed an accelerated or practice program so that our students are not only learning how to represent clients, but they're learning how to operate a law firm. Because for the reasons that Maureen pointed out and the statistics on the screen, so many of our graduates will go into small firms, will eventually hang a shingle themselves. They need to think about those firms as businesses and understand how to operate them. It is not enough to simply represent clients. Uh, and then we've taken all of this knowledge, made it available in a certificate program, and made it outward facing so that we not only are helping our students, but helping the industry as well uh, retool and prepare for these changes. So last thought, because I can tell Marty is about to give me the hook. I think I've passed my five minutes. Uh, yes, well, well past my five minutes. So uh, bottom line is we need to prepare students for a new world, a new kind of issue spotting, not just identifying the law, but we also need them to understand when they see an issue in practice, how they can reimagine it, how they can deliver that service in a new way and open up a whole range of new possibilities for them, uh, the legal industry and the clients that we are privileged to serve. So thank you very much. So my name is Brian Fong. I'm the research director at the Center on the Legal Profession at Harvard Law School. The center is an interesting place in that we actually, our core mission is studying lawyers. We actually don't do anything with the actual law. And the dirty little secret is I'm actually not a lawyer, which makes me one of the few in here. I'm what you call a non-lawyer. But um, <laughs> what I'm going to do as a non-human, but yeah. Um, what I thought I would do is there's lots of talk about disruption and innovation and change in the legal profession. We heard a little bit about it from Andy. What I wanted to do is look at three big uh, forces that I think are impacting not only the legal profession, but the world uh, in its entirety. The first is globalization. We focus a lot on domestic issues. Uh, but the first is globalization. The sec second is innovation. I have some interesting data to show you from a survey that we've been running. And the third is the changing nature of work. So start with globalization. You know, I, I should say, don't worry about reading the slides up here unless they're data. They're more for me than you. Um, they're kind of small. But the globalization of economic activity uh, and the movement of that from the traditional centers of the global north, by which we typically mean the United States, Europe, to the global south is one of the defining features of the 21st century. And we like to say, if that's changing sort of the world in its entirety, why wouldn't it change the legal profession? So to start thinking about this, in 2010, we did this big project, which we call Globalization Lawyers and Emerging Economies, or GLEE, as we like to call it after the TV show. And we really wanted to study how globalization is impacting some of the most important emerging economies, and in particular, the BRICS. We started in India, China, and Brazil, uh, where we, we looked at, at the core, how, how the opening of the economies in these countries was impacting uh, their legal professions. And what we looked at was things like the emergence of large law firms, the growth of in-house legal departments, and then how those things rippled out to change other things in, the, in their economies, like legal education, like regulation, like professional identity formation. And you know, why does that matter for us? You know, we found one big trend. Law firms and in-house legal departments are becoming increasingly sophisticated in each of these jurisdictions and are increasingly challenging um, global players. So just some examples. We now see Chinese law firms, domestic Chinese law firms, hiring away associates from global firms who may be working in London or in Hong Kong or in even the United States and making them partners. We see mergers, my, the, the, the most recent being the merger from Dashang and Dentons. And I keep in, I always point out, the first name in that merger is not Dentons, it's Dashang. And it's not even Dashang, it's the Chinese character for that word. This is the largest law firm in the world. We see foreign officers being challenges. So we did a big study of um, foreign offices within China. And we interviewed a bunch of people, and they would always say, well, of course we need a, an office in China if we're going to be a global law firm. China, to be in China means to be global. Well, here's what the thing. They're incredibly unprofitable for most law firms, yet they have it. Dina Work talked a little bit about LLM students. There's 50 Chinese national 
three-year JD students at Harvard Law School right now. Where are they going to go? We're launching this project in Africa, where according to the IMF, by 2050, Africa and the Middle East could comp comprise more than 20% of global GDP. That's a lot. Who's going to serve these markets and how? How does globalization also work? Um, why does it also matter? Global competencies, intercultural understandings. We used to call this a soft skill. Well, it's really more than a soft skill. These complex regulatory regimes. How about new models of legal organization? So in the UK, you have something called you know, alternative business structures. People often think this is, you know, you can float a law firm on a stock exchange. Yeah, that may happen. It happened in, in, in Australia a little bit. But really why it matters is you can have venture capital investment. We look at things like platforms and the big four. So the big four we, we typically call accounting firms. Well, they call themselves globally integrated business solution providers. I have no idea what that means. But I'm pretty sure law has a big part of it. They also like to say they don't want the bet the company work. They want the run the company work. You have global organizations like the IBA. You have GATS. These are going to change how we think about the legal profession globally, but also here in the United States. We have increasing importance of South-South relationships. So we're going to have to get used to the point that the ABA is maybe not the center of the universe, and that what goes on between China and Brazil and South Africa and India is equally important. And we have huge government investment. One of the big things I want to stress is the state, the reemergence of the state. So in China, you have them picking national champions. Singapore, they have something called FLIP, which is, uh, I'm going to blank on the uh, acronym, but they invested something like uh, uh, 500 million US dollars in a innovation center, a legal innovation center in Singapore. Some of that money went to a very big uh, company here in the United States uh, that does, uh, that has really great commercials. <laughs> <laughs> so innovation. So if I were to ask you guys, how would you build a car? You'd probably start with maybe I would design the wheels, then I would design the chassis, then I would, you know, I would argue that that may actually miss the point of the question. So we, we like to put this one up. You can figure out what's the right way and the wrong way, or a better way and a worse way. On the top way, it's you design a car, but you don't get anything useful till you get the car. The bottom way is thinking you actually don't want the car. That's not the point of the question. What you really are trying to get is a faster way to get somewhere. And along the way, you have a, have a way of doing it that the end is not simply the, 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 the end product is, 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 is achieved along the way. So we like to call this project operationalizing innovation. You know, in-house legal departments, as, as uh, Andy noted, are increasingly powerful. Yet GCs report that they have seen, 73% of global GCs report they have seen no innovation in their primary law firms. Now I want to stress innovation means different things to different people in different organizations. And I think the question is how do these differing and potentially competing objectives impact as their approaches? I also want to stress really importantly that innovation is more than technology. And even for technology to be effective, it needs to be combined with deep understandings of legal practice. We, uh, this is public knowledge, we work with a, 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 a global design firm called IDEO out in California. They are literally the people that sort of designed the Apple mouse, they designed all these like, products, and they've moved into services. And they told us a story about how they were asked to help redesign the associate review process at a big global law firm, it was Hogan Lovells. And you know, associate reviews, how boring can it be? And, and, and the firm initially kind of thought, these are young people, we should use some sort of technology solution. Well, they bring in IDEO who put them through this design thinking process. And then there's a write-up in the Wall Street Journal at the end of this, at the end of this. And the sub-headline is, and there's not even an app for that. They had completely redesigned this associate review process for millennials, and there was no app. Yet it was highly innovative. I also stress not all innovation is the same. We like to say you have sustaining innovations, which allow incumbents to operate more efficiently. It's an efficiency question. But this often will and may block real innovation. You have disruptive innovations, which totally change everything. And we'll, when I post the slides, we'll, we'll, I have some more examples of that. But we also have what we call adaptive innovations that embrace a client's need by changing not what they do, but also how they do it. Key to all of this are questions of value, not just cost 
but ultimately of quality. How do you measure the quality of the product based on some sort of objective output-based metric? Typically, we measure quality in legal services by input-based metrics. How many hours did it take? What were the credentials of the lawyer providing it? We often like to say, if you're going to buy a car, do you look at the credentials of the chief designer of the car? Probably not. You probably just test drive the car, or talk to your friends about if they like the car, or read consumer reports. So we're researching what is, how, so part of this is how are firms actually operationalizing innovations? And a key factor of this are two groups. One group Andy pointed out, which are the head of legal operations within companies that have enormous power. The second are head of innovations within law firms, which is an increasingly important role. So let's, let me tell you a little bit about what we know so far. Law firms. These are head of innovations of law firms. They're mostly men, 71%. Only about 30% of women. You know, the, the, the data is a little fuzzy here. We have to figure out more. The majority actually don't report they have JDs, but I want to point out the big number. 71% say they're not practicing law. In other words, this is a full-time job for them, running innovation within a law firm. Other backgrounds, information technology, project management, design thinking. They're pretty powerful positions. About 50% are purporting to the managing partner, 21% uh, to, the, to the executive committee. Here's in-house legal departments. And this first statistic, you cannot make up. 79% female, 22% male, the exact inverse of law firms. They view themselves as part of the legal community. Uh, they, again, reporting to the GCs. So what are these teams charged with? Law firms, the bigger the box, the more, the, the, the more relevant the charge. You know, AI and process management are the top two. Here's in-house. Let me draw your attention to one thing. Law firms really like AI. We call this shiny new toys. What do in-house not really like? AI, it's not as important. It's not that they don't like it, it's just not as important. Law firms are often building hammers looking for nails. Who are the sources of support? You know, law firms, it's you know, often the professional staff, not the lawyers and market forces. In-house, it's typically the legal department management and the legal department lawyers. So there's a difference here. What are the sources of resistance to innovation? Law firms, money and deviation from existing practices, doing things differently. In-house, you know, there's res resistance from the legal department lawyers, but it's much smaller than the in-house than it is in law firms. Uh, since we're short on time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go skip over this one and go to the changing nature of work. We like to say there aren't legal problems. There are problem problems, of which people are trying to make legal the smallest part of them. What keeps general counsel up at night? This is from an ALM study. Data security, risk management, fragmentary regular regimes. All of these legal is a part of it, but it's just a part of it. But law firms are designed to deliver services by lawyers who are driven to specialize at a very early age. Another interesting stat. Fortune 500 companies, and the average age in 1950 was 60 years. In 2020, it's going to be 12 years. Who's running them? Young and diverse people. The gig economy. This is a, just some stats about remote work. It's going up. And it's actually a balance between people want to work remote, but they also need some time together. Increasingly, a millennial workforce attracted autonomy and control, but also want constant feedback. They're better educated than their parents. If these are changing the entire economy, why aren't they changing the legal profession? T-shaped lawyers, core legal competencies, knowledge of law, but also complementary competencies, business literature, tech fluency, teamwork, some of the things that Dean Perlman talked about. And it's critical for lawyers to learn both to work effectively with others, but also for others. Both are important. And senior year lawyers, mid-career mid and senior year, also need to, to give a chance to, to develop career building skills. We often, HBS currently runs their, Harvard Business School currently runs their model as 60% MBA, 40% executive education. In the next couple of years, they want to flip that. Because, you know, an associate who graduates Harvard Law School doesn't need to know how to run a law firm when they graduate Harvard Law School. They need to know it 10 or 15 years into their career. <laughs> Last slide, change in continuity. These things are changing the legal profession. For all that's changed, that doesn't mean all should change. So first, traditional models are still profitable, like $3 billion law firms. Relationships still matter, and they still matter deeply. 
we like to talk about elevator assets that law firms and, and companies, they really don't need to lock their doors at night because the most valuable thing comes in in the morning, rides the elevator up, leaves in the night, rides the elevator down. It's people. And then finally, law as a source of stability. We talked a little bit about that. So the, the goal is to ensure alignment between the two, which is why I'm happy to speak with you today. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Marty Mazzoni, and I have the easiest moderator job in the world because I don't think we really have time for any questions here. Um, but I will just say that there's a bio on each of our futurist and thought leaders and, that you were handed, and they're all writers. There's all kinds of material that expands on some of these ideas. Also, what they have, these slides are available on the MCLE website, or they will be after this event, so you can capture some of the data that they went through. And I just want to say thank you again to this wonderful panel and <laughs> introduce Mike.